what do all these numbers mean? And why do they connect to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube? Those are probably the questions that you're asking yourself now. But these numbers, which are pretty large scale, and their connection to these social media platforms matter because they pertain to the actions of Russia prior to the 2016 presidential election in the United States. The Russian government sponsored an initiative to infiltrate those social media platforms, create fake accounts, and start to spread fake news and misinformation to try and mislead the American public. They did things like this. Each of these examples shows the same thing and tell the same story. The Russian government felt that by spreading fake news, they could play into the emotions of the American public, which may ultimately sway their vote one way or the other. We do not know for a fact whether or not the spread of fake news and Russia's involvement swung the election one way or the other. But what is alarming is that a large-scale amount of Americans did interact with and share fake news with uh, themselves, obviously, and others. Stanford researchers wanted to look into this question, too. And they wanted to look directly into how people interacted with fake news. They took a sample of fake news sites and found that 159 million visits occurred in the month of the election. That was about 0.64 visits per U.S. adult. Researchers at MIT wanted to see how viral fake news could be. And what they found was that fake news has a greater tendency to become viral compared to that of real news. So those examples from earlier could have been shared, uh, it could become more viral compared to that of things from a site such as the New York Times, for example. This picture shows Emma Gonzalez, a survivor of the Parkland, Florida school shooting. On the right is the real image from Teen Vogue of her tearing up a, a target. The image on the left is the doctored image her, of her tearing up the Constitution, which ties into this because it's obviously trying to play into the emotions of the viewer. This is why I teach. I want our students and our future generations to avoid falling into the trap of believing the things that we have seen so far. We need a citizen body that can discern fact from fiction. I don't want people fooled anymore. If our democracy is to survive, we need a citizen body that is well-informed and can make those crucial decisions. This is why I teach, and this is why I love what I do. I get to make that difference. But I got into teaching because I care about our country, our values, and our principles. In order for these things to thrive and continue on, we do need to see a transformation because our citizen body is not well equipped to discern fact from fiction. That with you and not with politicians, not with presidents, not with office seekers, but you is the question, shall the union and shall the liberties of this country be preserved to the latest generation? These words from Lincoln tell us the power of the individual in American society, that we have a major part to play. Citizens vote, they petition, they protest, they use civil disobedience, and all of these things are amazing, but they are useless, they are powerless, if these actions are taken with false information and misleading information. So how do we determine fact from fiction? How do we tell our kids, how do we tell our, our friends who are adults about how to discern a quality piece of information from information that might be intended to mislead us. The first question we must ask is who wrote it or who produced the source? What are their credentials? Are they a, an experienced journalist? Do they have background in the material they're covering? Or are they inexperienced and non-experts on the category that they're studying? That is a pivotal question. In addition to that, we must also ask who is the intended audience of the author? Are they just trying to reach a general audience to inform us? Or are they targeting a smaller base? To know the audience is to know the purpose behind the story. If it's general and targeting a large group of people, it's likely meant to inform. 
But digging deeper, we must also ask, who are the sources in the story? For example, if it's a story about the spread of a disease, do they cite the CDC? Do they cite physicians? Or do they cite anybody at all? If there's no sources to back up the statements made, then we probably cannot trust that information. We also must ask, why is the story being written? This one is rather basic. Is it meant to inform? Or is it meant as a piece of propaganda, trying to play into the emotions of the audience? Obviously, we need to look for those that are trying to inform us and give us facts. Finally, we can also ask the question, when was the story written? A lot of the times, these stories can pull in information from years ago, which is out of context and not helpful for the information trying to be presented to the audience. Finally, above all else, if you do not ask those questions, there are sites that do it for you. PolitiFact, Snopes, and Fact Check all do a great job of checking information for reliability and validity. So use these if you are questioning whether or not a source of information is true. And it's 100% on us, the people, American citizens, to prevent the spread of this kind of information. We have a job, and our role as the individual is powerful, as Lincoln has showed us. We must act, and we must be able to discern fact from fiction if we want our values, our principles, to continue to thrive for future generations.